Tonight we're continuing our series that we've entitled Psalms for Supernatural Living. We're going to be looking at Psalm 78 this evening. And, and uh, Psalm 78 is a psalm that is in, infrequently memorized, it's infrequently studied, and it's actually frequently ignored. It, it doesn't have those deeply moving poetic words like what you find in psalms like Psalm 23. And it's, it, it's not a psalm of comfort particularly. It's not a psalm of, of, of great uh, encouragement or exhortation or anything like that. It, it really never even intends to be that. But if you'll look at the very first part of the psalm, before it even really gets started, you'll notice that there's a subtitle and it says a masculine of, of Asaph. Now, Asaph was, David, was David's chief musician. He was the leader of the singers in the temple. He was the leader of the, of the musicians, the instrumentalists in the temple. And, and he, but he was also the co-author of many, many psalms. Now, we don't know it, it, whether Asaph co-wrote those with David or he wrote them on his own or he just scribed many of those psalms for David. But we do know his name is on many of those psalms. Now that, uh, um, that word, a, a masculine, it's a, a, a contemplative psalm. It's a, it's a psalm of instruction. It's a teaching psalm. It's, it's not supposed to be exhortational uh, or have a, even necessarily be a word of reproof, reproof although uh, it, that is in there. It's intended to be instructional, and psalms like this are often ignored. You'll find as you go through the psalms, if you go through there and find all of the psalms that have this inscription uh, describing them as a, a masculine, you'll, you, you'll, you'll find that they are often the least studied, the, the least read, and, and frankly, the least popular of all the psalms, especially in contemporary America. Because, you know, we, we don't like to work through anything very much. Modern Americans don't like to endure anything that, that lasts more than five minutes. We, we don't want to read anything that's uh, longer than a paragraph. Uh, we, we don't want to struggle with anything that has any difficulty to it. We, we really want it delivered to us at the drive through window, if you know what I mean. So the, the instructional psalms are, are often uh, ignored in chem, contemporary America. However you'll find that there's a good deal of meat here, and I pray that somehow God will bring it forth. So let's read it together, beginning in verse 1. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. In incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter insightful sayings of old, which we have heard and known what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, but will tell the coming generation of the praises of the Lord and His strength and the wonderful works that He has done. For he established a rule in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel, which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children, that the generation to come might know them, even the children who are not yet born, who, who will arise and declare them to their children, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. And they might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation that did not set their hearts steadfast and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I, I'm believing you today, Lord God, that uh, for the next few moments, that, uh, that your spirit will so commune with us in a, deep in our innermost beings, Lord God, that we will, we will find profit for our souls, that you will speak to us, you will change us, you will say to us what needs to be said. And Lord, I, I know that I, can't, I can do none of this on my own. Lord, I am not worthy to be, uh, to, to, to be the vessel to teach any of this. But Lord, I pray that you would speak to us. God, let your word be sweeter than honey. Let it be more, more valuable to us than, than gold. And, and Lord, I know only you can do this. And I'm believing you for it. And I'm thanking you in advance for it. In the strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Psalm 78 is a history psalm. And we're, we're going to approach it this evening uh, from several different directions and, and see some order in which we can impose on this psalm. The, the first thing I want to point out to you is that the first eight voice, verses, first eight vo verses that we just read uh, are a preface. The first eight verses talk to us about what, what's uh, about to happen, what he's about to talk about in the psalm, and then, and then it, and it exhorts us to pay attention. Would you notice what, what he begins with? He, he begins by talking about inclining our ears. Look, look at the first verse. Give ear, O my people, to my teaching. 
incline your ears to the words of my mouth. Now, this phrase translated in, into English, it, it really lacks some of the punch that it has in the original Hebrew. It, it doesn't mean to listen casually. It, it means to listen intently, uh, to, to really pay attention. In fact, the Hebrew phrase here actually implies uh, actually inclining of the ear, uh, technically speaking, to as one might uh, might lean over to someone who is whispering and put your ear near to their mouth so you can hear what they're saying. That's the implication of the words here. Incline your ear to the words of my mouth. Therefore, it means to us, he's saying, listen carefully because there's something very important. There's some deep, serious things I want to talk to you about. You know, I believe one of the hardest things that God has to do in modern America is to get our attention. Charles Finney once said that, the, that the, one of the things that hinders revival the most is distraction. And the reality is that there has never been a, 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 a more uh, ge- uh, easily distracted generation than modern Americans. You know, there are many, many things happening around us. There are so many things going on. There, uh, there are so many things that, that just clamor for our, our attention. There's so many things that want us to pay attention to it. Uh, there are things, these things are constantly calling to us with such delights for the flesh and such delights for entertainment and such uh, flamboyance. And, you know, the, the media is so expo- expert at calling us and getting, us our, getting our attention in fact, even our phones, our, our phones are constantly calling for our attention. You know, many families can't even sit down for a, a meal together and have dinner together without everybody looking at their phone and, and they're interacting with their phone instead of actually talking with the people that are sitting across the table from them. And I, I think that it's often extremely difficult for that still small voice of God to break through uh, all of that stuff and to be able to say to us, incline your ear to the words of my mouth. You know, if there is ever a time when God could do that with some uh, facility, surely it's, it's in a Bible study or in a Sunday school class or in a worship service. Therefore, I would exhort you in this way, uh, when you come to a worship service or when you watch a, a church service online and when you're, or when you're sitting in a Sunday school class or a Bible study or something like that, if you don't pray this all the time, at least then pray and guard your heart. Ask God to give you the ability to concentrate intensely, incline your ear to the words of God's mouth. You know, I know that sometimes church services and Bible studies can go long and and I'm not trying to rebuke anybody if it's dip, you have difficulty focusing, but I am exhorting you in this way, as, as much as you possibly can, learn to listen. Learn to listen. You know, one of the things that's happening in American schools, and if you teach at a public school, I'm not saying anything negative about you at all, uh, but, but listen to me for just a moment, and I think you'll agree with, with what I'm saying. But, you know, the public school teacher is, is fighting an uphill battle 99% of the time trying to teach his or her students. And, and I'm not talking about just trying to teach them the things that, that, they're, that they're supposed to teach them, but, but to teach them how to learn. You know, the hardest battle in the contemporary, uh, that the contemporary teacher is, is fight, facing is, is to, to get his or her students into a place where they can learn because they're not being taught how to pay attention. In fact, everything that they're doing, everything they interact with teaches them to have very short attention spans and, and many students just don't know how to listen. So we're in the same boat. So we need to ask God to give us a heart and a spirit to incline to the words of his mouth. So, so say, God, let me hear you in, 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 in what, with what you're saying. Let me hear in this everything that you want to say to me. Help me to get out of this what you want me to get out of this. Help me to really listen to you. You know, when you find your mind wandering, when... When you find yourself being distracted by other things, by things that are going on, by other things that you need to be thinking about, then in that moment, I encourage you to pray and say, God, help me to listen. 
And let me just say to you that, that I, I've struggled with this in ministry as my, myself, you know, in terms of counseling or, or maybe praying with people around the altar, things like that. I, I'm often distracted, you know. Uh, some, some of you that have been involved in altar ministry, uh, you, you'll, you'll understand this, but you're down there and you're trying to pray with somebody and you hear the voices of other people uh, around you and, and I'm easily distracted. I, I'm drawn aside Sometimes when I'm talking with, with someone who is seeking counsel or they're looking for some sort of advice or they're, they need a word, word from God on a particular issue in their life, I often find myself thinking ahead or, or, or my mind tends to run ahead to the ne next appointment or to the next thing that I need to, need to accomplish or, or maybe I'm thinking about the thing that happened in the last appointment or some other issue that needs attention in the church and, and in those moments I have to pray to myself silently and just say, God, help me to listen to this person. Help me to hear them. Help me to really listen and pay attention. You know, and I believe we have to come to God with the same posture when we, when we deal with Him. In prayer, I, I think if, if we can say, oh God, help me to hear you. Help me to really listen in my prayer time. You know, the most difficult thing I face in prayer is actually getting myself to really hear what God is saying to me. You know, you probably don't struggle with this, I, 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 but, but I, I, often I'm so intent on hearing, on, excuse me, on God hearing what I have to say that I, I don't seem to have the time or the inclination to listen to Him. I, I, you know, I just want Him to listen to me. Now, the problem is this. If God hears everything I say, it isn't going to change how He runs the universe one little bit. However, if I can hear everything that He is saying to me, then it will absolutely change my life. You know, in hearing sermons, you know, I ought to preach a message sometime about how to listen to a sermon. Uh, it's, it's sort of a lost art anymore. But, but uh, you know, the most difficult task I face as a, as a communicator is getting and keeping the attention of a congregation. You know, I, I would say that the American congregation today does not really know how to listen. We don't know how to incline our ears to hear the words of God's mouth. And, and then in that moment to ask for personal application, God, what are you saying to me? I, I heard about a preacher that was holding revival services in an inner city church. And the church was primarily African American. And I, I have to say, I've got to tell you, I love preaching in churches that are, that are primarily African-American churches. When we were living in Georgetown, South Carolina, I had the privilege, privilege of doing that a few times. And, and uh, one, one year in particular, I remember uh, I was asked to preach at the community Thanksgiving service. What would happen is all the churches would gather together on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving, and, and we would all come together for a single service, and, and many different churches would participate. One church might uh, might be in charge of leading worship, and then another church might have special music, another church might have a choir that was going to sing, or whatever. You had all these different things, and one year, the Ministerial Alliance asked me to preach at that, and, and uh, the congregation that gathers there uh, in, that, in that service is, uh, is uh, very racially diverse, and and, uh, and it was wonderful. I, I, just I just remember preaching that, and as I was preaching, I, I, look, let me just say this. I don't know if you realize this, but, but if you've never experienced this, but, but uh, churches that are predominantly African American tend to be uh, significantly more interactive than churches that are predominantly Caucasian. And, and so anyway, that night as I began to preach, there were, there were these great men and women of God in the congregation, and, and they just really started getting into the message. And we just sort of developed a rhythm as we were going along. I would say something, and they would jump back up and shout something back to me, and we, just, we were just rolling along. I mean, I didn't know if I was egging them on or they were egging me on. I don't know which it was, but it was just awesome. After a while, I didn't know if I was preaching to them or they were preaching to me. I just really didn't know. Anyway, this, this preacher was holding a, these revival services in a church like that. It was, and uh, and uh, one night during, this, during one of the services, he was preaching along, and the elders of the church would sit on the front row, and the, and, uh, the mothers of the church would sit on the, on the other side. And Anyway, he was preaching along, and, and all of a sudden, in the middle of his message, one of those elders stood up, and he turned around and faced the congregation and shouted at the top of his lungs. He said, he got me that time. And then he turned around and sat down. And the preacher was just so discombobulated, he, he couldn't even finish the sermon. It just, it just threw him off. 
You know, but, but, but what was happening there, it's one of those rare moments where somebody said, I heard that and it did not have application to my mother-in-law or to my family or to my friend or to anybody else. God, you're talking to me. You're talking to me right now. Now, following the preface to Psalm 78, we enter into the next uh, section, verses 9 through 41, and this section has to do with the history of Israel in the wilderness. Now, let me just give you a breakdown of the entire chapter, and then we'll come back to this in a moment. Verses 9 through 41 talks about the history of the, of the Israelites in the, in the wilderness, and then verses 42 through 52, that's a par parenthetical insertion uh, that talks about God's wonderful works uh, of deliverance from Egypt. Now, when, I, when you hear that and when you read that, it, it may appear to you that those are backwards because God, God's talking to them about the history of their providence, how God has provided for them, how God gave them food and manna and the quail, and, and then talks about the rebellion, their hard-heartedness, their difficulty to deal with, all of those things. And he comes to the end of all of that, and then he goes back and starts talking about all that he did for them in Egypt. Now, you and I, we read that, and it seems like that's backwards. But if you look at it more closely with diligent study, I think you'll see this. What is happening is God is reminding them of that which they have forgotten. He, he comes to the end of the whole thing and he says, you've forgotten my power. You, you've forgotten all that I did for you in Egypt. See, the great sin of Israel in the wilderness was not that they rebelled against God. Now, although that was sin, it, it was not that they worshiped the golden calf, although that was a sin. The great sin that they had was not that they murmured against God when they didn't have what they wanted, though that was a sin. The great sin of Israel in the wilderness was that they did all of these things after their supernatural deliverance from Egypt. That's the reason for this parenthetical insertion that follows the history of their time in the wilderness. Now that's verses 42 through 52. Now verses 53 through 56, that's God dealing with the tribes of Israel following the, the occupation of the promised land. Uh, or you can read it together with me. Verse 64, he says, Their priests fell by the sword, and the widows made no lamentation. Then the Lord awoke as one out of sleep, and like a mighty man who shouts because of wine, he routed his enemies back, and he made them a perpetual reproach. Now that's actually... Speaking of, the, of a time when the Ark of the Covenant was captured by the Philistines. You remember uh, under the priesthood of Eli, Eli's son, Phinehas, and Hophni, they, they carried the Ark of the Covenant into battle against the Philistines, and they were defeated, and the, and the Ark of the Covenant was captured. 30,000 Israeli soldiers died on that, on that, in that battle. Phinehas and Hophni they were, they were killed, and, and the Ark of the Covenant was captured. And when word of this got back to e Eli, their father, uh, e Eli, pitched backward off the bench on which he was sitting and, and, and broke his neck and he died. Furthermore, Phineas's wife went into premature labor and she died during her, her de delivery of that child. And as she expired, she named her child, the child born to her, Ichabod. Now, or as we say it in English, Ichabod. Now, kabod is the Hebrew word that means glory, and ich means not. So it means not glory, or there is no glory. So she, she named that child that was born to her as she died on the day that, that the high priest uh, 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 was killed or died, the day that her priest husband had been killed, the day that her father-in-law uh, had, had died, the day that her brother-in-law was killed, and the day that the Ark of the Covenant was captured and Israel was defeated, she named her child on that day, the glory of God has departed from us. That's what she named the child. In other words, the generation to follow was born in a time of spiritual and political and economic and military disaster. The glory of God had left, and she said that, and then she died. Then, then God, seeing that, arose, and he smote the Philistines who had captured the Ark of the Covenant, 
And, uh, and eventually, you, can, you have to read the story. I don't have time to go into all of it. It's a, it's a marvelous story. But eventually, the Philistines returned the Ark of the Covenant because they said, we have got to get this out of our camp because God had struck them with tumors and among other things. So that's what this passage of Scripture is referring to. Now, this is a real turning point in this psalm. I want to show what happens next because then in verses uh, 67 through 72, the last section of the psalm, he, it has to do with the transference of leadership from the ten tribes to Judah, leading to the selection that God made of David to be the ruler of Israel. Okay, so that's the outline. Now let's go back and work through that just a little bit. Verses 9 through 41, the section dealing with Israel in the wilderness. Now there are some parts and some extremely, that are extremely important and that are full of meaning for us today. So the first one is this. In that passage, there's a, there's a time where God rebukes them, the children of Israel, for the need uh, uh, for quail, the longing for flesh to eat. Now, they were being fed by manna. You, you remember that? It was spiritual food. God sent. God supplied. God provided food not only for their bodies, but for their souls. It was, it was really a picture of the Word of God. It was a picture of the Holy Spirit. It was a picture of Jesus coming down as the bread from heaven. It was a picture of, of God's providence, God's care for them in every way, body, mind, and spirit. Now, you, you may hear this and you may ask yourself, what's the big deal about saying, God, we're tired of this manna. And they were tired of it. I remember Keith Green wrote a song uh, years and years ago that, that it was a very creative and imaginative song that, uh, about the Israelites getting tired of manna. And he talked about how they were saying how they made manna hot cakes and they made manna souffle and manna cotti and all these things. And they, they just said, Lord, not manna again. They were so tired of it. So why was God so upset with them? Because they wanted flesh to eat, because they wanted this meat. Well, what is involved here is a uh, threefold cycle, downward or upward, that, that implied more than simply what they ate or, or more than their, simply their murmuring about the diet with which God has supplied them. I, I want to show you this. The issue was self-satisfaction and self Fulfillment versus God's glory. See, when they concentrated on themselves, they entered into the area of the lust of the flesh. And when they entered into the lust of the flesh, then they wanted the fulfillment of the flesh and the actual moment of sin. And God, God saw the longing for the satisfaction of, of the palate for, the, for this flesh. To God, it meant that they were not satisfied with spiritual food. They weren't satisfied with what he had given to them, the supernatural food. Now, on the other hand, it works the other way. If we live by faith, then we want God's glory. If we want God's glory, the result is contentment in our lives. And the Bible says that godly contentment is great gain. If we have contentment, then we are fed by his hand and we are satisfied with the fruit of the spirit. And that, that's manna. See, the spirit man grows in an atmosphere of contentment. The flesh man grows in an atmosphere of discontentment. And the Israelites were discontented. They were murmurers. They were flesh-oriented. They were, they were not yielded to God. They, they longed for flesh. They were rebellious against the idea of manna. They, they wanted to feed their own appetites. They weren't content with, with eating, with what, eating whatever God supplied to them. But what God wanted was, a, was a, a people that were spiritually oriented, that were obedient and contented and satisfied. It was longing for the things of God, wanting His glory and willing to wait on Him. Now, now listen, this, this is very important. Someone, you, you may be sitting here listening to this and you may be thinking to yourself, but God sent the quail. If God sent the quail, how can he be angry with them because they ate it? Listen, God loves you so much and he is utterly determined to get a hold of your life. If he can get hold of your life by, by the handle of obedience, he will and he will bless you in it. But however, if he can only get a hold of your life 
by the handles of rebellion and sin, if you're detem- determined to have sin and, the, and determined to have the things of sin, you can claim those things and you can want those things, but God loves you so much that if he sees that's the only way he can get through to you, then he will let you have it. I don't even have time to get into Romans chapter 1 about the wrath of God and him turning us over to our own desires. Listen, if you want flesh, God will allow you to have flesh. You remember what he said, though, in the book of Numbers? This is what he, he, he said. And say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wept in the hearing of the Lord, saying, Who will give us meat to eat? For it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore, the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat not one day, or two days, or five days, or ten days, or twenty days, but a whole month until it comes out at your nostrils and it will be nauseating to you because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and you, and you have wept before Him saying, Why did we ever come out of Egypt? God says, If you want flesh, I will give you flesh. If you want meat, I'll give you meat. What does it say? The Bible is always so graphic. I love this. God says, I will give you so much meat until it runs out of your nose and it makes you want to throw up. God says, you want flesh? I will give you more than your fill of flesh. You know, I believe God is saying this to America. If you want to become discontented, murmuring, griping, materialistic, rebellious, proud, self-centered, if you want flesh, I'll give you flesh. I'll let you have all the flesh you want. You can have it in your movies. You can have it on your television shows. You can have it with your immorality, your uh, fornication, your adultery. You know, a, a whoremongering spirit haunts America. And he says, you want flesh? You can have flesh. I, can, I believe we can reach that point where God says, if that's what you want, you can have it, but you'll suffer the consequences of it. However, the, the day will come when flesh stinks in your nostrils. You know, a young 14-year-old girl went to talk to a pastor in his office, and she came in and sat down across the desk from him, and she said, I have destroyed my life. She said, I, I've just come from the, from the city health clinic. She said, I'm pregnant and I have two type, different types of venereal disease. She said, I, I, I want you to go with me and, and come and let's go talk to my father and tell him. And he said, well, he said, honey, do, do, do I know you? Do you attend our church? And she said, no, but you know, my father, he pastors the church that's just, that's just down the road. He said that, the pastor telling the story, he said that it was one of the worst things that he ever went through in his life was, was going with that little girl and telling her daddy. And when they got to the house, they, they stood there on the doorstep and rang the doorbell. And when her father answered the door, he, could, he knew something was terribly, terribly wrong. The pastor said he'll never forget the, the, the look of death on that man's face and the horror, absolute horror of that conversation. He, he watched that man get old right before his eyes. Well, that, that girl's father resigned his church and he took his wife and his daughter and they moved back to their home state where they had originally lived and so that she could uh, have her baby and try to be healed. But you know what? It was the end of that man's ministry and And really, in effect, it was the end of his life. The pastor remembers sitting there, looking at that 14-year-old girl, old, used up, broken. And he thought to himself, flesh stinks to her now. See, if we want flesh, God will allow us to have flesh. But it doesn't come without consequences. However, you know, we can ask God, we can say, God... Give me a longing for manna. I I know there may be somebody that's listening to this right now and they say, you know what? I don't have a longing for spiritual things. That's okay. That's okay. But just don't try to con God. Okay. You know, be be honest with him. Don't, you know, just say, God, I I, I don't long for you. I I long to long for you. I I don't ache for you as the deer uh, panting for the cooling water. I I don't, but, but I long to God. I'm not, I'm not hungry for the word, but I'm willing to be hungry for the word. God, I, I don't don't love prayer, but I, but I want to love prayer. See, see, the problem with the church in the wilderness 
was not that they had not known God, but, but that they had known God, that they had known His miraculous hand, that they, that they saw His power, they saw Him at work, and it didn't change anything. That was why God was so angry with them. It was, it was not as if these people had never seen His hand. They'd never seen His power. The plagues are all listed. They knew about those. The, the deliverance through the, the Red Sea of the people, through the waters of the Red Sea. He did everything in the world for them, and still they long for the flesh pots of, of Egypt. If you look at verse 36. Nevertheless, they flattered Him. Now who is Him? Well, him is God. Nevertheless, they flattered him with their mouth and they lied to him with their tongues for their heart was not devoted to him. Neither were they committed to his covenant. You say, how, how can I flatter God? Well, listen, to praise God without really meaning it is to flatter him. That's flattery. Now, there's a difference between a compliment and, and, and flattery. Husbands, if, if your wife walks into the room and she says, uh, hey, I've got a new dress. Do you, do you like it? What do you think about it? Listen, only a fool would answer with anything besides, wonderful, you look great. I love it. Now, listen, I want you to understand, that is not, that is not lying. That's just creative communication. That's what that is. But uh, you just say, wonderful, you look wonderful. That's not flattery. That's, that's a compliment that has the implication of emotion and the implication of love in it. Now, now listen, if I come into a church service and I praise God with my lips and I say the things that I think a good Christian ought to say, but my heart is not inclined to Him, then I am flattering God and it stinks in His nostrils. He cannot accept that it. it's really an abomination to Him. See, worship is not something that I do. But worship is an attitude of my heart. Therefore, listen, if I dance in the aisle on Sunday but keep a woman on the side throughout the week, I have flattered God and it is to my own destruction. There, there has been this, you know, the, the, the great horrible ab abomination of the past three or four decades of the American church is this. It is the, re the rediscovery of the joy of abandoned worship. Coupled with the death of holiness. And it will be the end of God's glory in our lives and in our churches. Wouldn't it be a horrible thing if God brings you into Pentecost, into the uh, spirit-filled church and brings you out of a tradition-bound past, leads, leads you through the Red Sea, and le leads us, you know, stands the water on end and leads us through on dry land and gets us to where He wants us to be and shows us uh, His power and, and He heals our sick and He delivers our bound and He brings us out and teaches us how to worship. And then at the end of it all, the baby that we bring forth is named Ichabod. Wouldn't it be a horrible thing if we learned how to speak in tongues, but we forgot how to pray? Wouldn't it be a horrible thing if we learned how to put our hands up in praise, but, but we don't learn how to keep our hands off of each other's wives? Wouldn't it be a horrible thing if, if I learned to pray in, other, in another language, but I don't learn how to pray with a clean heart? Wouldn't it be a horrible thing if I learned creativity in worship, and, but don't learn holiness of life? So that's what God's dealing with here in Psalm 78. He's, ta he's talking about a people that knew His almighty anointing and in the midst of the greatest assortment of miracles in history, lost God. They lost Him. See, that, that's why the Pentecostal and charismatic movement has to be so careful about our long-standing emphasis on healings and miracles. Listen, God knows I believe in miracles. God knows I believe in healings. I have seen Him do things that just blow my mind. But listen, uh, listen to me, incline your ear. If God gives us miracles and we do not give God our hearts, then the next generation will be born in captivity. God is speaking to this nation. God is speaking to His church. And I believe God is saying, I I've given you miracles. Now the question that God is asking us in Psalm 78 is, has that made any difference? Has it made any difference? Has it made any difference in the way we pray, in the way we talk, in the way we treat each other, and, and in the way that we live? See, the issue is not whether I get a miracle from God. The issue is whether or not God gets me. 
Listen to me, you know, looking back over the, over the years, you know, over the past decades, I can name 20 people of God without stopping, without hesitation, that, that walked in the miracle power of God, that are now living in rebellion against God, and their homes are being destroyed. Ichabod, no glory, it's gone. What, is it, what does it avail if we carry the Ark of the Covenant into battle with us if the Ark is captured by the enemy? You understand what I'm saying? God's dealing with the nation the same way. God is talking to America in Psalm 78. Listen, there, there, you know, there aren't many people anymore who actually remember the, the Great Depression. It was a terrible time of need and deprivation and hurt and, and loneliness and the bread lines. It's just, it, it, it must have been absolutely horrible. I've never seen anything like that in my lifetime. There may be some of you that can remember World War II. I mean, my goodness, I think about the years that my grandma spent uh, when my, my grandpa was gone and my grandma was all alone with all of her children, the loneliness that she went through and the need that they experienced living on a soldier's pay. All of us, can, just about all of us, can remember the horrific events of September 11th, 2011, excuse me, 2001. I can remember all of the heartache and the pain and the anger and the agony, all of those things that we went through as a nation. Many of you remember many other terrible things that our nation has been through. But I'm here to tell you, God has brought us through all of that. God brought us out. You know, that day that Pearl Harbor was bombed, in a way, the nation was up for grabs. It was in doubt whether there would be a United States in five years on the day that, the, that Pearl Harbor was bombed. See, it was in that moment that the possibility existed in the minds of people that, that we might be invaded on both coasts. I mean, England hung in the balance. France was already gone. Tyranny uh, was, was marching in from every direction. Uh, Rome was in the hands of the fascists. Germany was in the hands of the Nazis. The, the world was, was tottering underneath the boot of oppression. Uh, Japan was aflame with, with mili military ambition. And God brought us through. God brought us through. God brought this nation out. He delivered us. Listen, World War II was miracle after miracle after miracle. You'll, you'll never convince me in a million years that we won World War II because of our national resolve and our, and our national strength and the intellect of our military leaders. Listen, the Battle of Mid Midway was a miracle. If you don't know, read about what really happened in the Battle of Midway. You know, I, I believe that God turned the advice of Hitler's advisors into confusion in the council chambers of Nazi Germany. The, the very fact that Hitler attacked Russia instead of invi invading England, I, I believe it was the crucial turning point of World War II. Now, I'm no historian, but that's what I believe. If Hitler had ignored Russia and thrown the might of, of Nazi Germany against England, I'm not sure what the state of the free world would be like today. But I believe that God frustrated Hitler. I believe that Russia's unseasonably harsh winter of that year, the year of the invasion of Russia, was, that was the hand of God. And yet, where does America stand? Debauched, in rebellion, in sin, over 600,000 abortions every year. Drunkenness, drug addiction, immorality. I tell you, unless the church in the wilderness turns back to God for revival, God will look elsewhere. God then talks about rejecting Ephraim and turning to Judah and raising up David. See, see here's the cycle. You see it over and over again. The blessing of God, the prosperity of the people, the rebellion of the people, the wrath of God, the repentance of the people, and revival. The blessing of God, the prosperity of the people, the rebellion of the people, the wrath of God, the repentance of the people, and revival. And it, it's a cycle that goes, it's repeated over and over and over and over again. But, but here's the problem. What happens is that as the cycle is repeated over and over and over again, gradually we find a diminished capacity to genuinely repent wholeheartedly. So the revivals lose in power and they lose in a momentum. And our repentance then becomes a repentance for which we repent. Therefore, the blessing is partial and the revival won't endure. 
witness the book of Judges. The book of Judges is, is exactly this, the blessing of God, the pro prosperity of the people, the rebellion of the people, the wrath of God, the repentance of the people, the blessing of God, the prosperity of the people, and so on and so forth, over and over and over again. A judge comes, the people are delivered, God blesses, then the people rebel against Him and against God, and they, they fall to destruction, and God punishes His people, and they, then they turn to God, and God gives them another judge. The, the, the book of Judges is, is, a, is a story of people who couldn't stand prosperity prosperity. The problem was that gradually they gained a diminished capacity to fully repent. And the book of Judges just ends in a frazzle, just a horrible, horrible ending. The nation's falling to, to, to pieces. I mean, you, you could look at the nation and write Ichabod over it. The nation goes through this cycle over and over and over again, and it finally just comes to nothing. Now, God has given our nation several great awakenings. The first great awakening, the second great awakening. There was the Azusa Street Revival. You had the charismatic renewal. Each one of these roughly coincided with some great national disaster. Following the American Revolution, it was, it was the great awakening, the first great awakening under men like Francis Asbury and Peter Cartwright and Cotton Mather. Following the Civil War, there, were, there came a great revival under men like Dwight L. Moody and, and Sam Jones. You may not know this, but Dwight L. Moody was a chaplain in the Civil War, and he later became the great evangelist after the Civil War. The outpouring of, of God during the Azusa Street Revival coincided more or less with the First World War and the issues that followed that. The, the first Pentecostal move of God in the 20s and 30s followed World War I. The, the, then following World War II, there was, there was the outpouring of, of God through evangelists like Billy Graham. But you know, each revival movement was diminished in its ability to change the character of the people of the nation. You understand what I mean? I mean, listen, put it this way. There were, there were stadiums filled during B Billy Graham's ministry and his crusades. I mean, massive stadiums, massive crowds. The, the record crowd at the Los Angeles Coliseum is 105,000 people. And it wasn't for a football game. It, it was for a Billy, Billy Graham crusade. And if you'll look at, at the major stadiums all across America, you'll see that, that the record crowd in that stadium is often a Billy Graham crusade. But, but the issue remains why, in spite of those crowds, in spite of that move, why hasn't the character of this nation changed? Now listen, I'm not knocking Billy Graham. I mean, far, far be it from me. I mean, all he's ever done is preach to more people than I've ever even seen in my lifetime. But still, the question with which we must wrestle uh, is this question, why haven't we seen a change in the character of the nation? I mean, polls tell us that up to 73% of Americans identify themselves as Christian. Now, I don't believe that for a minute, not for a New York minute. Uh, do you believe that 73% of the voting uh, population of our nation is Christian and, and, and that we're in this mess that we're in morally? I don't believe that. No, no way. The fact of the matter is that the renewal movements lose their capacity to change the character of a nation. I mean, look at the history of churches. Look at the, the major denominations uh, in the world today. There's the blessing of God in the beginning. Then there's a, a, a falling away and there's partial repentance. There's unholiness of life. Then there comes decline. And sometimes there's a repentance that brings re restoration and the blessing of God and renewal. And then it followed by more decline. I've seen it over and over and over again. And you hear this and you say, okay, this sounds pretty bleak. So where, where's the hope? What's our hope? Well, here, here is our hope. L listen to this. I cannot be responsible for 40 years from now. And I am not answerable for 40 years ago, for the last generation. However, God holds me accountable for the state of my heart right now. Right now. I believe God wants to pour out His Spirit on America. I believe that it's not too late for America. Nevertheless, I believe that the next great move of God in America is going to come only if the American church repents of her fascination with the flamboyant and with the superficial and we get past this cotton candy mentality that wants to see people slain in the Spirit, but we don't really care if their hearts are changed. I believe that what God is saying to this nation is, 
I have a great awakening uh, stored up for you. I, I, I want to pour my power on you. I want to fill you with my glory. I, I want to change this nation. However, it will only come as the church lays hold of the profound things of God and inclines her ear to hear the words of his mouth. And we begin to say, say unto me, O God, whatever you want to say to me. Deal with me, God, not with somebody else. Deal with me. Change me, O God. You know, I believe with all my heart that God wants to pour out something that we have never seen, something that I have never seen. And the revival that God wants to bring will not come until we get past our obsession to be entertained. If we seek for flesh, God will give us flesh until it runs out of our noses. However, if in humble and contrite heart we seek manna from heaven, God will feed us with the bread of heaven. God, save our nation. God, save the church. God, save the people. God, send revival. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, that is the cry of our hearts. We know that there needs to be revival. We know that our nation is far from you. And the answer is not standing in the light and shouting at the darkness. The answer is not shaking our fist at those who are lost and those that are, that are, that are, that are pursuing the sins that, uh, that, they, that they love so much. That's not the answer, Lord God. The answer is not to lean up against the cross and smugly point at everybody and say, you better get right or you're going to hell. God, the answer is to start right here, Lord God, for us to begin to get on our face faces before you and for the church of Jesus Christ to begin to cry out to you and say, oh God, change me, change my heart, send revival to me, Lord God, put a, put a longing inside of my heart for the things uh, of God, put a, put a love in my heart for prayer, put a love in my heart for your word, change us, God, because we know that a revival is going to come to America, it starts with the people of God remembering the mighty hand of God, and letting you change us. And we thank you for what you're going to do. In the strong name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.